The Proleptic Journal of a Shite Extractor Tractor Man by Scott Waller. 5. Two days later. It's the weekend. I've had a nice long kip and I feel good. Good sleep is quality time, even when you're not strictly aware to enjoy it. What's the point in being conscious and bored when you can be unconscious and not happy in the slightest? That's what I say. Maybe I've struck a humble little wisdom vein with that insight. Who knows? One of the perks of my job is that you get paid for nodding off. To be more exact, I get paid for brain disposition time. While I'm sleeping, my mind is made available for research. That means my brain does not go into deep sleep. Otherwise, it would be of no use to them. It's a sort of mildly drug-induced half-sleep. To be honest, you don't wake up from it entirely refreshed. You can feel it in your body that it wasn't a proper sleep. I usually do this a couple of times a week. You're not allowed to do brain disposition and ad flush on the same day. Ad flush is company priority. It must be a bit mind-blowing for you. Getting paid for entertainment and sleeping? What's all that about? You're probably wondering. And it's true that we have life a lot easier than you. In your day, technology did not allow for such possibilities. Maybe if I recall how one ad flush item puts it, you'll get what I mean. Once upon a time, long, long ago, there was a pampered Indian prince who lived all his life in a vast palace. The prince never ventured beyond the palace complex's walls. In this palace, he had all his needs met by teams of servants and was lavished with court entertainment. After overhearing a conversation between two servants about their distant village, the prince was curious to discover the world beyond the parameters of his palace compound. One day he crept past the guards in the dead of night and abandoned his gilded cage. Once outside, he found that the world was assailed with old age, disease, suffering and death. The prince's answer to the problem was to practice the primitive technology of meditation. It was a pretty good answer for the times, but we've come a long way since then. The ad goes on to boast of its new products to ease life. These new products are only the tip of the iceberg of all the suffering relievers, asterix, that you don't have yet. Having said all that, sometimes our solutions create other problems. We haven't quite resolved the problem of death. We are still mortal beings, but we've made so many strides against life-threatening illness that we have acquired the irksome habit of living too long. While most of the main illnesses that used to be mortal can now be treated pretty efficiently, the body continues to age. The decline of the body makes life intolerable long before nature finishes us off. That's why artifice intervenes where nature has been cast aside like a useless gadget as the expression used to go. It has been calculated that if technology today was used at its maximum potential, we would be capable of prolonging everybody's biological existence up to an average of around 150 years. But if society were to pick up the health bill for every bedridden biddy dragging out a threadbare existence, the working young and able would have to spend most of their lives paying for the treatment. We simply have too much equipment to keep the body alive to allow everyone to have a natural death. We all accept that we age far beyond the point where life is comfortable and desirable to live. Instead of waiting for ageing to become unbearable and begging them to pull the plug on us, we plan for our end. We don't want to feel like we're a burden to others. The old must step aside for the new, as they say. Didn't Eskimos stay out in the cold to die when they could no longer contribute? If you hold back the march of the tribe, you get left behind. For us, generalised euthanasia is the price we pay for the march of progress in the areas of longevity and health. Whilst you lot tended to say, life is sacred, we think that life is sacred only when it is a qualitatively viable life. This way of thinking did not come easily. It had to contend with those people who thought that their particular irrational tradition was non-negotiable. Such folk had a regressive attachment to their radiant idea fetish that a mountain of evidence could not overshadow. But they were swept under the tide of history. As far as I can make out, 
A long time ago, there were some people who believed that the world was created in six days. Authorities once made it a punishable offence to say that the earth was not the centre of the universe. There were even people who thought that the sum total of commercial activity in an economy left alone was providentially guided by a purely beneficent invisible hand. Such irrationalists lost out to their progressive children before I was born, buried under inevitable social change. Our ingenious solution to human beings' irksome habit of outliving their cell-by date was to socialise individual lifespans. That's where PEZs come in. PEZ, P-E-S, stands for Pension Euthanasia Scheme. It's up to every individual to formulate their own PEZ with the aid of a PEZist, an advisor who works for a PEZ company. You decide, according to your means, how many years you want to collect your pension and at what rate at the end of your working life. It's a zero-sum game. Choose more years and get a smaller monthly allowance. Alternatively, you choose fewer years and get a bigger wad. The great thing is that even if you're poor, you can collect a handsome retirement pension for a short period, so long as you accept euthanasia at the end of the designated term. During that term, you can live royally. If you decide you want to risk a 50-year-plus pension plan, you'd either better be rich or be prepared to live on very little. This might seem unfair, but our society, unlike yours, can eliminate much of the injustice doled out by that tyrant called fortune. If you've got a wonky nose, society can put it back in place for a reasonable price. If you're born stupid or have a physical constitution with a low energy output capacity, you'll have a less demanding job, with fewer advantages. The less wealthy don't have to prolong their unlucky existence. They can go out with a bang during their final years, as though they've been born into the top stratum. It's your choice. Naturally, if you choose a short duration PES, but it turns out that you are fit and healthy, at the end of your agreed term, you still have to undergo the euthanasia treatment. This was the source of many a shed tear in the past when the system was in its infancy, but nowadays most people face their planned end with dignity and fortitude. In any case, your pezis takes into account your psychological profile, and if the tests show that you're likely to regret your decision, they won't validate your choice. Last-minute blubberers are sifted out from stoics before anything is signed. If, on the other hand, you don't have much money and you want to live long, you can choose an extended pez and cling on to your impoverished existence. I'm not very good at explaining it all, but I'm pretty sure it has all been worked out well by our automated social engineering programs. It all began with people who were genetically likely to die of an incurable disease. Once disease prediction became available, and a cure was not, people could either pay a hefty health insurance, or get offered a good insurance rate, on the condition that they decided to terminate their existence once their chronic illness started up, so as to avoid expensive treatment. Of course, some people signed in bad faith, promising to get euthanized when the time came, and then pulling out at the last minute. Either they were dishonest at the beginning, or cowardly at the end. The insurance companies lost out loads of money until the law was changed to protect them from such fraud. The authorities now deal strictly with fee fiddlers who try to have their cake and eat it. They are forced to abide by what they've signed for. Quite right, too. Many no-good selfish people of the lower stratum, I'm ashamed to add, got to thinking they can get above their station. But that wouldn't be fair. Why should they live the good life that they weren't born into when I can't? I should say something about the few remaining backward, technophobic fuddy-duddies who complain about the PEZ system, as they do about so many other life-improving innovations. Many of them claim that Mother Nature, whoever that old dear is, should decide when our existence should be terminated. They say that everyone should have equal rights and death, but that's a silly idea belonging to the hypocrisy of the pre-strata era. If there were equal pezzes, there would be no society at all. The young would be slaving away for the old. It's impossible for us to imagine a world without the pez. I mean, what kind of condition would we be in if someone like me had the same pez as somebody destined to important managerial responsibilities? 
say a Davosian chief executive owner, Asterix, or such like. It just wouldn't make sense. These Luddites talk in their old-fashioned, snobby way about humanism and equality and rights, but most of them are middle stratum romantic dreamers indulging in a patronising pity for us lower strata. Such people are bathing in idle fantasies about a life without the mod cons that have arisen from the rational mechanisation of our contemporary post-Hedleno society. Some of them, called outcasts, end up trying to live out their fantasies in an outzone, usually bordering a Rediplas. A few of these outcast communities even go and live in the no-go Rediplas. Who knows how they fare there? Do they thrive? Do they strive? Do they even survive? Either way, they don't get any sympathy from me. As for myself, I've chosen a medium-range Pez. I don't want to be poor or rich. What's more? I enjoy my job and intend to stay plugged into my company beyond my retirement, if I can, so as to feel useful. Three days later. I'm happy with my lot, and I'm lucky to be generally happy with my lot. But there is something there. I can't put my finger on it. It's a tiny little dark blue feeling squirming away inside. I sometimes speak to my mechano sex bitch Dolly about it. Good evening, my sex slave. Had a good day in the cupboard? Yes, sex hunk. How was your day? Oh, I might just fancy a quickie, actually. I haven't done you an expanded bum mode for a while. That would be nice. Oh, hang on. Your ass went saggy on me the last time we tried that. I should explain that Dolly is equipped with ABF, adjustable bottom size function, which worked great when I first got her, but has been a bit unreliable of late. I really want to suck off. I love your penis in my mouth. Why don't you relax? It does not matter if you cannot finish again. All right, stop there. Never mind. You try, I suppose. Anyways, I'm tired. Did you have a hard day, dear? The usual. I don't know what interests me any more sometimes. Why don't you relax? I'll give you a massage. I need to walk. I'm mentally tired. But I need to do something. I know a way you can get some exercise, handsome. I just want to talk. We can go for a jog through Ice Age Europe on your home system. I don't like jogging. You know that. You know that sport is good for the body and the mind. What about a walk? Okay, I fancy a bit of Aztec country. So I sling on the helmet, set up the virtual location program on my home system, whip out the foot-sensitive mat, plug Dolly in, and off we go for our trot through a virtually reconstituted Teotihuacan. As we are walking towards the virtual Great Pyramid, I tell my virtually walking virtual companion that I've been going through a funny patch over the past few months. I don't know why. She suggested that I have a word with a company doctor at work. Sex dolls are programmed to give you that kind of advice. Their manufacturers belong to the corporate federation that wants employees to share as much information with HM, human management, departments as possible, especially when it might relate to performance ability. I said that I wasn't so keen on the company doctor because he wasn't friendly. She then suggested I see a private doctor but I'm not spending a fortune on a private doctor for something that will eventually go away on its own. And in any case, you can never be certain that the records of your consultation with a private doctor don't leak out. And then if the company does find out you've been hiding something from them, they might decide to investigate. I've heard it happen that if you are in small trouble over performance in your job, then the work system automatically starts ferreting about. If they find out that you might be of less service to the company, it might affect your future. Small problems can snowball into big problems. I've got a good record, so it shouldn't worry me, even though it does simmer away at the back of my mind. If they see that you are a health risk, they move you on to the grey list. The blow is mainly psychological. The lower strata always gets some kind of job or other. It's just not always the one you want. That's the advantage of being a lower stratum. There is no pressure about social demotion the way there is for the middle stratum, because there is no stratum below us. Anyway, 
Dolly was of no help, as I expected. But hearing myself speaking sort of convinced me that I was moaning about nothing. So the blue worm went underground. It will no doubt re-emerge, so long as it doesn't rear its ugly, wriggling head too often. I suppose I can live with the little bugger. Two days later. I eventually caved into Dolly's advice and got myself examined by a private doctor on the slip net. I was fully strapped in and linked up Sensoro electronically to a medical centre thousands of miles away. They ran a series of health check tests on me. I don't have anything serious according to the readings. The virtual doctor test program was very reassuring. According to the doctor, he said that my mood troubles are temporary and linked to my age and work, while my vital bioenergy producing organisms are a little run down. It's true that I do feel pains every now and then, and that's not due to too much bodily activity, rest assured, because I was born a lazy sod. Throughout my life, if anything like sports or exercise threatened to come my way, I would scarp up for the nearest hiding place. As far as the psychological side of the analysis went, some elements of my past are re-emerging into the present, whatever that means. Doc says I have to do some emotio profiling tests to define what the problem is and get the best treatment recommendation. But as for now, I'm just to have normal doses of pharmacostimulation and relax with light neuro games and neurodramas. I was also advised to spend one afternoon a month in seismotherapy at a health centre affiliated with the doctor's medical company. There I'll get shaken about by bone-juddering machines that thrust your body around from side to side and wobble different limbs at different rates. I've never done that before. It sounds fun. The health centre's neuro brochure says that you come out the experience a new person. One week later. I had my first seismotherapy session today. The treatment involved lying down on my front in a dark room with red, green and blue lasers firing at me and robots scuttling out from the walls, sending electro waves around different parts of my body, injecting things inside me, flexing my joints and tugging my limbs in and out of place. Then the serious shaking and wobbling goes on. It hurt at the beginning, especially in the paunch area where I underwent a little flab whiplash, but then it became relaxing. Now I feel a lot healthier. At that price, it had better. Yesterday, I had quite a long real-life face-to-face conversation with another EE tractor man called Nige. Such conversations are something of a privilege in my job, as most of our work is solitary. He said something quite interesting about our profession that he found on a Neuropedia feed, which provides a philosophical vindication of our trade. He didn't grasp much but he sent me the reference. I can't say I can get my head round it fully either, but apparently it's based on the ideas of some philosopher with a fulsome head of white hair, whose writing was so impenetrable that you had to spend years understanding it. Only once those years were spent and lost could you know for sure that it wasn't worth the effort in the first place. But by then it was too late. You'd invested too much of your life becoming a specialist in his work and your livelihood depended on pretending that he was the bee's knees. I don't know about all that, but I did find interesting his argument that the Western metaphysical tradition is biased at its base, and has been suffering for millennia from aurocentrism and proctophobia. These are Neuropedia's terms, not mine. That means it has an underlying prejudice in favour of the mouth, to the exclusion of the anus. The same tradition can also be shown to be Borocentric and scatophobic, these traits involve a similar discrimination in favour of food and against excrement. And yet, as Nigel rightly points out, you can't have one without the other. Both constitute essential parts of the human condition. I don't know what all this means, but Nigel was pretty chuffed about it, as though some long standing wrong had been exposed. So I thought I'd mention it as an example of a not very typical conversation between two workmates who don't even talk to each other that often. We then got onto the subject of health. He said that he'd been having mental health issues and physical problems, not dissimilar to mine, for years now. He's been gently encouraged into semi-retirement at the moment by the company doctor. He seems to be coping with personal decline quite well, on the surface anyway. He's a lot older than me, 
and, of course, the thought came to me, might the same fate be awaiting me down the line? But then I dismissed the idea. That's negative thinking. I'm not like that. I'm a born optimist, and that will keep me going forward way after I've reached his age. Still, it was nice to talk to him, but there's something about him, something about his negativity that gives me the jitters. One week later. It's funny. When I began my journal, I spoke wrote big chunks in bursts of enthusiasm. Now I find myself struggling on some days. Recently, I've only been able to write in drips and drabs. I'm realising that my life is just not very interesting, but I still feel the need to communicate. I prepared some drafts, recorded on the Dictaphone app on my arm chip, but I didn't feed them into the machine for fear that they would be of no interest to you. I suppose it's like the need to confess in the old days when people believed in all that religion stuff, but I don't know what I would need to confess. What I do know is that speak writing about my life and about the world makes me think about things differently. It makes me think about myself differently. I sometimes get the feeling that the journal is opening up parts of me that should be left buried. On occasions I start to brood. Although I'm better now, thanks to my Strapping Guardians programs, which regularly jog me into joviality with various neurotainment treatments, combined with pharmacobioadjustments. But too much of that jogging into mental health can be annoying, especially when you think you've got used to something, and then you find yourself sliding back down the steep beginnings of the learning curve. I did wonder whether this journal itself was getting me down. As you know, I can't tell anyone about it except for you and I'm not sure that counts. True, the undivided devotion of a mechanical sex slave helps you get through the day, but my dear old Dolly does have the rather annoying habit of spouting out reams of trite consolation. She means well, insofar as a machine can mean anything. Sometimes she senses my mood changes, and will hastily shift from empathy mode to kinky sex kitten mode. The sudden change is too brutal. It reminds me that, basically, she's a machine pulling out stock solutions to satisfy a punter's whims and urges. Then she disgusts me, or I disgust myself, I don't know which. Perhaps I'm outgrowing her and I need to give her a serious mental upgrade, or even get a new model completely, but that costs money. Long before Dolly, I almost tried it with a real woman, but she decided that we were incompatible. At the time I cried, got intoxicated and moaned about my lonely lot for a spell. Then I got over it and moved on. Now I'm older, I appreciate the peace and calm that comes with not having to answer to a real human. This, I should add, is normal for us. Gone are the days when people actually wanted to live with the same person for a whole lifetime. Most people say that it's too much of an effort to keep a real intimate relationship going for anything more than a medium period. It's an inefficient use of energy. People stick to their own individual comfort zone and don't like sharing it with someone else. Occasionally you meet people that still live in the old ways who claim that they would have it no other way, but I am not sure I believe them. In any case, I'm too old to find an attractive real woman, so I settle for virtual beauty. Two days later, I wanted to get in touch with Dennis and tell him my theory that this journal was having a negative impact on my mood. Unfortunately, he wasn't available. He hasn't returned the messages I left on his neuro receiver, Asterix. I haven't seen trace of him at work, and he made it clear that I was never to contact him through his work identification, so I won't. I can't help wondering whether they've found out about him. Chrono Research it's very unusual stuff. He's quite a shady character when I think about it, and he's managed to drag me into his schemes. Has he done the same thing with other people? How much trouble would I be in if anyone found out? I suppose if the worst comes to the worst, I can always claim to be a victim in the whole business. Yes, I'll tell Mr Finn that I was manipulated by this guy who is much cleverer than me. After all, Thick old me can hardly be expected to know the technical ins and outs of chrono technology. He's probably involved in other dodgy dealings that have nothing to do with me. Surely no one in their right mind would believe that I was at fault. I'm a snail, protected by the shell of my own insignificance. The following week. By chance, 
I kept a copy of some journal entry drafts that I recorded on my arm chip dictaphone. As I listened to them, I had a good laugh at myself. Anyone would think that it was only a matter of days before the corpse disposal company was digging a hole in the ground for me. Not that I would pay for a burial, a privilege, if that's what it is, rarely enjoyed by Lois Charter. Nothing could be further from the truth. I'm fine. Everything's hunky-dory. In fact, I've even acquired a temporary function. I've become the ground technical assistant to a new manager, and an upper manager at that. Mr. Finn is middle management. We're up to five days in the week. Who would have thought that I, middle-aged E.E. tractor man, would have become a ground technical assistant to an upper manager? If truth be known, it's not that uncommon. Big managers are out of touch with the realities of the train and need feedback from people with experience. To be sure, we're hardly lavished with respect. Upper managers are aloof and can be quite insulting. But that's just part of the job. My upper manager, almost half my age, wants to make sure that if I thought I might have a vague claim to moral superiority on account of my lengthy experience, any such claim was rendered null and void by his immensely superior competence. That is almost verbatim from the upper managerial horse's mouth, by the way. I don't actually do much outside the strapping pod but they are kind enough to let on that I am not completely worthless, even if I am worth less in bonus opportunities than before. I won't be driving around to residences that often. I'll miss that. Still, better look on the bright side, if I don't want to get bombarded with head and nose stimulants. There are supposed to be four of us in my new office, but it's mostly just me with this guy Fred. He's about ten years older than me. He's only been in this office for six years but he sometimes makes out like he's got decades more valuable experience than me. He can be standoffish at times, as though someone had forced him to share his bedroom with a stranger. I get fed up with Fred when he gets that way, but I haven't said anything to him yet. I don't want to make things worse. He doesn't talk much. Few years, nodes, I suppose, and I don't know. He's probably become a bit comatose in his pod over the years. But he is company of some sort, and that's something, isn't it? What surprises me is that I've reached that age when they start shifting you around the firm like that. I thought I had plenty more years in me. You don't notice time creeping up on you. One minute you're prancing around, never thinking about tomorrow. Next, tomorrow's gripping your throat with its vice-like hold. Still... There are far worse fates than being a ground technical assistant to an upper manager at my age. As for the other two members of the team, their strap-in seats are mostly empty, and when they are in them, they don't talk much to us. They are younger, a man and a woman, and are sent off to other stations a fair bit. I have seen the man twice and the woman only double that. They are more qualified than the two of us, and are doing quality control. Fred tells me that they'll be back in their strapping seats more often later.